This is the first forum in a series. So this is about the central city today. We will try and answer any questions you have, but we will be focused more on the central city. There will be things that we don't have a lot of detail on, but the Mayor and the Minister have both been very clear with me that they want to be open and honest. And so we really want to have a good free flowing conversation. Today we'll hear from two panels. So we'll have an address from the Minister, an address from the Mayor, and then move to a panel discussion. We'll have a short break and then a further panel discussion. Following that, we'll then have some informal networking. So general housekeeping, there is media in the audience today. They are here in their capacity as leaders, but they will also be reporting on the event. So if there's anything that you don't want to see on the front page of the press, I suggest keeping that for a discussion later on in the day. Um, if you need the bathroom, they're just out in the foyer. If there is an emergency, we follow the green man out this way and out the top and follow an usher. Now onto the exciting part. Our facilitator today will no, need no introduction to anyone in this room. Joanna was slightly ahead of the current girl power um, movement in Christchurch when she became the first editor of the Christchurch Press in 2012. She is an internationally respected journalist, a wonderful leader who is passionate about our city, strong in her views and a genuinely lovely person. Her role today is to facilitate an open, honest discussion, encouraging participation from our panellists and from our audience. Please join me in welcoming Jo. Thank you very much, Renee. That's a certainly very kind introduction. I love that word, Renee, those words when they use as champions and influencers. And as she says, it's great to see so many of you here in the room this afternoon. Now, of course, I should start by thanking Renee, who has pulled this together um, on behalf of the Minister and the Mayor at really short notice, and to see so many of those champions and influencers not only here on our panel today, but in the room is a real test testament to the energy and drive that Renee uh, views this community with and has been able to facilitate in this community. So I want to start by thanking Renee for putting this together today. pleasure to be here this afternoon to support and, as Renee says, to facilitate this conversation. My role is simply to facilitate um, what will be, I'm sure, a robust but also respectful conversation about this city and its future. I will be inviting our panellists to answer specific questions, but more importantly, facilitating questions from you, because all of you represent important perspectives in this community and have a role to play. So I know that you will have many questions. I expect to see hands shoot up pretty quickly and we do have roving mics so that all of you can be heard. If on the off chance you're a little bit shy, I do have some questions of my own. <laughs> now there certainly is a great deal happening in the city and region and this is a really important opportunity for us to take stock as to where we are and where we're going as a community. Where, how far we've come in the past six years and where we hope to be over the next few years. There are still, of course, a great many opportunities before us, and these are opportunities that we as a community cannot afford to miss. There are a great many long-awaited milestones that are still before us and will be achieved, we hope, in the next 18 months. And it's really important that we as city leaders, the business community, and most importantly, the people of Christchurch are well placed to take advantage of these. Um, there have been a few lost and squandered opportunities in the past six years, and I believe it's important that we stay focused on ensuring that people from all walks of life can fully participate in the rebirth of our city. I hardly need to point out the obvious that there are a great many power players in the room today, but it's essential that all of us here take the opportunity to represent and advocate for those who are not here those who are vulnerable in our community, and those who need to fully participate in everything that the rebuild of the city has to offer. <clears throat> so as I say, this is an opportunity for us all to talk collectively about those opportunities and the role that not only our panellists, but everybody in this room can play in order to support those. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce our panellists, though they hardly need any introduction. Today on our panel we have the Honourable Nikki Wagner, Minister for Greater Christchurch Regeneration and Minister for Disabilities. Welcome Nikki. <laughs> Leanne Dalziel, Mayor of Christchurch. <laughs> Robin Wallace, Director of Earthquake Response and Recovery for Te Terunanga of Naitahu. 
Will McClellan, Epic Innovator Precinct co-founder. And Lauren Merritt, Chief Awesome Officer, who has not only the best job title, but it's great fun, uh, from the Ministry of Awesome. In the second half of today's session, we will also be welcoming to the stage Christchurch International Airport CEO Malcolm Johns and City Developer Richard Peebles. So to kick things off, you've heard enough from me, as I say, I'm simply facilitating today. We're now going to hear from Minister Wagner and Leanne Dalziel, who will outline their views on the progress within the city over the past six years and also give some insights as to where we're going. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joanna. Kia ora, good afternoon. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you all for coming today. It's important that we're all here in this room. Um, as you may know, I've just taken over the role of Minister Supporting Greater Christchurch Regeneration. I'm the alternative Jerry Brownlee. And I've had a really interesting and busy last six weeks. I was born and raised in Christchurch. The city is my home, and it's the reason I got into politics. So I'm totally committed to ensuring that Christchurch is a great place to live, a great place to work, and a great place to raise a family, not just for now, but for future generations as well. There's absolutely no doubt that we've gone through some very tough times, and that there's still a lot of work still to do. But right now, I really feel that Christchurch can and is becoming a city of real opportunity. I've been working alongside the Mayor, the Council, Regenerate Christchurch, Otakaro, and numerous other agencies and community groups. And I know that everyone is focused on making the most of every opportunity to create something special in our city. And that's why we're all here today. It's to share information, to share ideas, to answer questions, and together shape the future of the city. The government estimates that the total cost of recovery and regeneration will be more than $40 billion. Rebuilding a city and its communities, as we're all learning, is an incredibly complex undertaking. And we all want to see faster progress and more action. And despite, or maybe because of our impatience, every day more projects are being completed. We're taking the opportunity to modernise the city, to turn it around, to make better use of the Avon River, and to create more people-friendly public spaces. And we're making sure that our civic and public buildings incorporate modern and high engineering design. Together, I believe we're building a better and safer city, and those high quality buildings, I think, will see the results and it will be worth the wait. The completed projects are performing well. The Hagley Oval, the Bus Exchange, Oi Manawa, that's the Canterbury Earthquake National Memorial, and in the Otakaro Avon River Corridor, Watermark, the Terraces, and the Margaret Mahi Playground. They're all drawing people into the city. And in fact, these facilities are very quickly becoming an important part of our lives. We're also making progress on the residential red zones. The Waimakariri Red Zone Recovery Plan is now underway, and the outline for the draft Otakaro Avon River Corridor Regeneration Plan, that's our residential red zone, has been approved. Also, Skirt, that's world famous in Canterbury, of course, the horizontal infrastructure program is almost complete. Now, if we think in terms of the residential rebuild, since March 2011, over 48,000 consents, totaling $10.6 billion for new builds or alterations, have been issued for Greater Christchurch. Over 71,000 homes have been repaired. 
and 3,793 have been rebuilt. There's also been over 89,500 cash settlements. So overall, insurance has paid out $19.8 billion. 98% of our undercap residential properties and 88% of our overcap properties have been resolved. But we all know there's still some way to go. And those final cases are often the most complex and the most difficult. There are also several priority areas that still require Crown support. And perhaps the most visible and the most divisive of these is the Christchurch Cathedral. We are absolutely committed to working with the Anglican Church, the Council, the business community, philanthropic and heritage agencies and other key stakeholders to find an agreed solution. Agreement is key because any decision that ties everyone up in the courts for a further five to ten years really isn't a decision at all. We're also working on a refreshed cost-share agreement with the Council. We're working to reach agreement across a wide range of matters, and that's to enable us to transition back to local leadership and to normalise the relationship between the Crown and the Council. In terms of regeneration planning, we, I hope to receive the first regeneration plan, the Cranford regeneration plan, before September. One of the things I think is important is increasing foot traffic in the centre city. To catalyse the rebuild, the government has committed to returning public sector workforce to the central city. Some of those have already moved in and there are new developments to open in the next six months. And overall, we expect to see 1,500 government employees coming into our city every day. And that will really kickstart the downtown business. The Greater Christchurch Regeneration Act was passed in <coughs> April 2016. And that's when we moved from recovery to regeneration, shifting from central government-led recovery to a locally-led regeneration. And that's why the Mayor and I are standing here together today. A number of agencies are tasked with the ongoing work, and they include two new agencies, Autocargo Limited, a Crown-owned company, and Regenerate Christchurch, a Crown Council joint entity. Work has also been inherited by other government departments, including the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, and Land Information in New Zealand. Central government will gradually step back from a leadership role over the next few years and local institutions such as the Christchurch City Council will take over. One of my first actions as Regeneration Minister was to commit to keeping the community up to date with information as much as possible. Since then I have been releasing weekly progress updates on various sectors or topics including housing, employment, well-being and tourism. That's through the Greater Christchurch Dashboard and I'll continue to do that. The data collected in the Tourism Dashboard shows that while the sector is not quite yet back to pre-quake levels, things are improving rapidly with visitor numbers and accommodation capacity increasing. The Wellbeing Dashboard and that's based on the Canterbury District Health Board's Canterbury Wellbeing Survey, shows that time does heal, and all the indices are slowly improving. At the end of last year, eight out of 10 Greater Christchurch residents rated their quality of life as good or extremely good, which is on par with other regions across the country. But stress, is still a factor here, and we need to make sure that we're supporting those who are still struggling with earthquake issues. Finally, as Joanna has mentioned, this is the first of a series of opportunities 
to talk about Christchurch, to talk about its future, to consider progress, challenges and milestones, and to dis discuss key issues. I hope you will all join us. Thank you for being involved today. Thank you for coming. I think it's important that we're all here because every single one of us wants the best for our city. And that requires us all to be proactive and to work together to make the most of every opportunity that comes our way. Now I'd like to hand over to the Mayor. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa and thank you for um, being here today uh, in the first of what will be a series of opportunities for us to come together and talk about the things that matter to Christchurch. As the Mayor of a city that has been through such a significant event, there, are, um, there is a lot of international interest in our story and Christchurch's story. And if you think about Lonely Planet and the New York Times, really interested in the creativity and the innovation that seems to have sprung from nowhere in response to um, our, our situation signalling our recovery from the earthquakes. Um, I like this quote uh, a lot. Uh, you never let a serious crisis go to waste, but it's the second part of it that really captures my imagination. It's an opportunity to do things you think you couldn't do before. And that's actually the truth of the situation that Christchurch has found itself in. We now have an opportunity to do things that we think we couldn't do before. Now obviously that means build back better. Um, innovation and seismic and environmental design have enabled buildings to have more resilience, making them more sustainable and cost effective across the life of the building. The engineering school at Canterbury University is in the top 3% in the world. You know, this is a great opportunity for them to take some of the ideas that they've been working on over years and actually seeing them uh, come to fruition. I've put Forte Health up there, that's 180% of the new building standard and it has used some incredibly innovative energy dissipation units incorporated in design in buildings that would normally only see them um, in concrete. I've got an image of the Isaac Theatre Royal. What a wonderful and tremendous restoration project that sees the, the facade, the magnificent dome and the grand staircase preserved. The art gallery story is not so much a base isolation story, but the ground stabilisation saw 124 jet grout columns between three to four metres in diameter and up to six and a half metres in depth. Um, and the re-levelling of this building sees 1.5 million uh, litres of grout underneath that building. Um, it was injected, controlled on an average two millimetres per day as it levelled uh, the building, um, sometimes requiring up to 182 millimetres. So it's been an extraordinary effort uh, just in itself. People often forget, the Minister talked about skirt, about what's actually been done. 1.3 million square metres of road, around 600 kilometres of pipe, over 100 pump stations and reservoirs, nearly 150 bridges and culverts and 180 retaining walls. Um, as she said, we've shifted from recovery now to regeneration. And I love that word regeneration because it captures two elements. First of all, it captures the idea of the new growth, but it also captures the concept of restoration. Sarah has been disestablished and we have a new regeneration framework. Regenerate Christchurch has a board that has been jointly appointed by the government and the council with Naitahu having nominated one of the government's appointments. It's an excellent model and I'm incredibly optimistic for what it will achieve. The future of the residential red zone would have to be one of the most incredible opportunities a city could ever have to rethink an area of more than 600 hectares. Hagley Park is just under 165 hectares, so we're actually talking about an area that's four times the size of Hagley Park. Even if only two, half of that was allocated, we would still have double uh, what Hagley Park, 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 Park is to offer our city. Our opportunity though, um, with all of this, is to look for um, the future, look to the future, what is coming. 
our opportunity is to become a smart city and we've been using the jigsaw puzzle as a bit of a metaphor. You've got to try things, a bit of trial and error, you've got to be prepared to fail and that's what I like about Christchurch is that Christchurch is big enough so that you can trial things that are scalable but you, that you were actually small enough to fail. You can actually fail fast and get up and, and learn from that and try again. Uh, learning fast is an important part of being a smart city. But as you can see from the slide, people are right at the heart of that. We have to have collaborative planning and citizen participation if we are genuinely to take advantage of the technologies that are to come. The Smart Cities programme um, shoulders the risk of the, of the innovation. They are determined to learn fast. They do use trials and they do leverage existing, um, existing programs. And I just look, I'm not going to talk through these because we've been given five minutes. I just want you to just get an idea of some of the technologies that we're just trialling at the moment. Some of them are very small, um, some, of the, some of them are incredibly progressive, and some of them will really enable us as a city um, to, oh, I'm pressing the wrong thing, um, to, to take the opportunities that um, are, are being, de being developed. And of course, this is all um, open source uh, work that we're um, doing so others can leverage um, off what we do as well. So you can see why I really want to see Christchurch as a bit of a test bed for what's coming um, in the future. Even before I was elected mayor, I was determined that Christchurch would become part of the um, 100 Resilient Cities Network, uh, um, uh, pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. And the reason that I was so motivated to become part of that network was because I was absolutely wanting to be part of an organisation or a network that understood that resilience was not a destination, it was a journey. And it's something that you continually strive for. You can never say that you are resilient, but that you are striving to be resilient. It means the capacity to respond to um, adversity, but also the ability to thrive in the face of adversity. And I like this word cloud, because if you pick out the words that sit around resilience, they are flexibility, diversity, creativity, and adaptation. And that's what resilience means um, when you think about it. And if you actually think of all of the other things, resilient cities, smart cities, healthy cities, and sustainable cities, they're all the same thing. They're all part of exactly the same story. We've also, um, we're, we're, we've been talking to government about how we might see building community wellbeing and resilience together in a partnership in this new way of working with each other. And we have pledged um, a mutually uh, joined up fund in order to enable that to happen. But we're also becoming a hotbed of innovation. We're going to have Malcolm Johns up here from the airport company, a real life living laboratory for the technologies of the future. The autonomous shuttle was being tested in Christchurch at the airport. We are developing a shared fleet of electric vehicles that will include the public sector and the private sector. We are determined to be ahead of the curve. We are New Zealand's oldest city and we are now becoming New Zealand's newest city. And that's incredibly exciting. We have redefined ourselves. Christchurch is a city of opportunity. We are open to new ideas, new people, and new ways of doing things. A place where anything is possible. We can help find solutions to global problems. We can take a leadership role on the challenges of sustainability and climate change. We can literally lead the way. Proud of our history, prepared for an uncertain future, equipped with the knowledge that we have within our communities, the ability to take on any challenge, that is Christchurch's story. And we're in a very interesting um, part of our journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne and Nikki. Some really interesting concepts coming through there. Um, some, some real basics, some of those real hygiene factors that we expect from a rebuilding city, resilience, strong communities, strong infrastructure, 
absolutely the things that we expect from our elected officials um, and those they appoint to rebuild the city. But also some looser co concepts that are also really important. Opportunity, the ability to fail fast and the capacity to innovate. And that's some of the things that we're here to talk about today. So I, I'm going to start with a couple of questions, but if you can start to throw your hands up if you have questions of your own, and um, we will start to take questions from the floor. But my first question is for Will and Lauren. You heard that discussion around that need for innovation, that opportunity we have to truly innovate uh, within the regeneration of Christchurch. Do you, Will, think that we've made enough of that and taken the opportunities to innovate? And what more could be done? Nice, easy one to start with, yeah? There's been opportunities missed. You, you can look back with hindsight, which is 2020, and say, oh, I wish we'd done X or I wish we'd done Y. And, and also, I think I have to caveat the general we is a dangerous term. Have we? Well, not everybody gets to make decisions, um, and not everybody wants to make decisions. So I think we've got to sort of put that on one side as well. Um, personally, I carry a lot of frustrations about things that haven't been achieved. But I also feel incredibly blessed when I look around the city at some of the crazy stuff that has been achieved. So it sounds like a cop-out answer, um, but I can only speak from personal experience. I'm really stoked with the partnership and what we were able to do in the middle of the city with Epic, obviously, and getting people back in there. I have seen some great collaboration and partnerships uh, appear. Um, and it, but it felt like two years after we got going, there was, uh, there was some brick walls that were kind of impossible to get through. And uh, maybe if we could rewind the clock again and, uh, and, and find a way through, around or over some of those brick walls, we could have achieved a little bit more. Would you care to talk about what some of those brick walls were and what some of the possible solutions are? <laughs> Easy ones, yeah. Mm, when I said yes. Um, so, we there's some interesting things just been put up on there about fail fast and take risks and, and very startup words. Um, but there's a difference, I think, between the government taking risks and individuals taking risks. Like I sit here on the stage and, and me and Colin borrowed millions of dollars personally. And I don't want to fail. <laughs> I don't want to have uh, the bank chasing me. Well done, but you still owe us. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a level of harsh reality uh, that I think stronger partnerships could have been built. Um, the partnerships that we've had with the council was outstanding. Uh, MB and NZTE stepped up to the plate. And, you know, everybody has to put some chips on the table if you're going to play. Um, a lot of people talked good and then left. And, um, you know, that's when it fails. And that's the, when the walls come up and you just cannot get past because if... It's going to take four of you to get to the next step, and one of you says all the right things but, but doesn't step up, then you can't do it. And, um, you know, there was, there was the conversations that, that we were involved with about sort of phase two and bigger developments. That takes bigger land. And um, there wasn't the opportunity, um, I think, for people to step up and put those chips on the table. So these are, these are very personal things. I'm sure there was, there was lots of, of other things going on around the city. But um, yeah, that's my two pen if I should fill up and let Lauren yeah, speak. Look, look, re really great, honestly, then. And working at, at a different level of the Ministry of Orsa, which is, of course, all about partnerships, but not necessarily some of the infrastructure challenges that, that Will alludes to. So, Lauren, what more could have been done, and have we done enough to really innovate as a community? Yeah, so definitely the way I look at the world, I don't often look at what should have been done or which, how, we, how we should have changed it. I'm like, okay, it is what it is, what are we going to do about that? So, um, I, and I also make no point, I wasn't here prior to earthquakes, I moved here five and a half years ago, and that's just my viewpoint around the city, this is how I've known it. So I've always looked at what can I do, how can I contribute in that. Um, particularly around this space of the innovation precinct, uh, I was looking around, um, you know, that our office started there, we, you know, that was when Agropolis was down there and Rad Bikes and C1 just opened up and it was the first little, you know, first cafe in the city and there wasn't much else there. And um, I'm really impressed and proud with the partnerships that have, got, that have been created in that space. I think it's an interesting concept to um, 
to <coughs> trap innovation into a precinct. Uh, but I also think it's great we have a space dedicated to it with acknowledging that it's through everything, everywhere, all the time as well. Um, so it's been, it's been really amazing to see the partnerships and things that we have created that have then attracted things like Vodafone Zone to come or some of the other companies that are in the precinct. I think that's a real testament to what we did contribute and we did create that other cities wanted to then partner. Um, the one thing, one thing I think has been missed um, is, de is the real inclusion of the community in that development. Um, we, we lost things like Agropolis and Round Bikes and that type of stuff. We've actually physically moved out of the innovation precincts as well, um, although we're close by, if that's it. Um, so, so I think that's been a huge part of it has been at some stage there was a lot of effort and conversation with the community, then there was development, and now it's kind of getting the conversation with the community going again, and I think we've missed out something in that gap. Um, so I think things like um, the, the, the other venues in the innovation precinct that you could really include that, say like Greenhouse, love it, space with more pressure than Z. Um, but I think that's great, it's a beautiful opportunity. Now what's missing is filling it with people to activate the space. So that's what I think the main thing out the way is activating. And now I wonder if uh, Leanne or Nikki, you want to reflect on that comment that perhaps the community was missing from the conversation for a period of time. Other view have a viewpoint on that? Well, I think that, I mean, that, that's been um, my view. Um, obviously, I've spoken about that a lot, but I think that's the real benefit of the new regeneration planning model because, in, in many respects, the community is at the heart of the whole process. And so uh, it is a real opportunity um, in, in terms of, because I mean, a number of the things that they're looking at, obviously the residential red zone, but they're also looking at Cathedral Square and the surrounding areas, and that will be out for a, a public conversation, and that will spark a lot of interest mm. back inside the heart of the CBD. So, um, but, but I agree with you, I think that, that you can really, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to have a consultation in order that everyone agrees, but you have to have an engagement that enables people to understand and you know different perspectives and take people on a journey. That's what's going to organically grow the, the, the wonderful balance of, um, of, of, the, of the central city. It's going to be fantastic. I think um, you make the point of activation and engagement. Uh, a really rich city, rich in spirituality and emotion and being involved is about people and for me somebody who lives in the centre city to bring people back into the city is really important too and I think we're beginning to see that there's much more um, inner city um, housing being developed the east frame will bring those people back in and when you live somewhere and you're there you are engaged you do activate 24 7 and I think that's going to add great value to our city. Yeah, and just making sure to then provide the platforms and the pathways for people to activate. You can bring people in, you can live there, but if there's not that platform to actually connect and contribute, that's where it gets lost. But I think there'll be less of the precinct feeling about the city as we develop. I think it was important to ensure that there was going to be, um, you know, sort of dedicated spaces to different elements. But I think it will start to blend together. Um, I used to, I mean, I'm, I was, I loved when you said about innovation precinct, I always used to call it an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, a really good point. We are going to get to the precincts um, in the second half, so it's also, because I think Richard, you'll have quite an interesting perspective on that. Um, now, one partnership that of course is very, very important is the partnership between Naitahu Council and the how well that partnership has gone from Naitahu's point of view and have we maximised it as a community? So uh, from the beginning, or in, in the beginning, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, we were obviously given a, a special place and a relationship and we, uh, with the Recovery Act and becoming a statutory partner gave us the ability to be in a co-governance and we had a, a great relationship with Sarah um, across um, across multiple layers, which uh, for us was fantastic. Um, not so much at that time with the council. However, today we know, and with the government, you know, I guess starting to move out, um, that 
the next phases, we really need, it is critical for us to have a relationship with the council, and that is what we want to do. We would like to be able to investigate how we continue that co-governance model that was created under the, uh, the CIA Act. Um, because I think for us, to, and we talk about our heritage, um, not just our heritage, but the heritage of this city, to be able to present that to everyone re um, requires that we're all involved in that. So, uh, yeah, from our point of view, I think there have been some, it's been really good. It's just how do we continue, how do we continue that and to have those conversations? But, um, and the opportunities that that involves, because for Naitaha, we're really interested in um, relationship. It's pivotal. Um, alliances and partnerships around the opportunities that exist for this city. Um, and as time goes by, um, we worry about the brand of our city if we don't, um, if we can't make things happen a little more quickly than we have in the past. So back to Will and Laura's point then, so it, it's a wonderful partnership that was established at the start of the rebuild at a governance level, but have we adequately fostered everyday members of the iwi and involved them in the rebuild of Christchurch? So I, I'll say there are some difficulties around um, multiple layers of engagement because it requires a lot of resource. So what we need to, and what we are doing is looking at what are the things that are most important. We did it through the loop and the loop and every other loop. So, recovery plan for those. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, what is important? So, where are, are we best placed to commit our resource um, to be able to make the best possible um, to give the best best possible value. Um, at the end of the day, for Naitahu, we are, we are owners in perpetuity. We are not going anywhere, um, not from Christchurch, but not from the south. So that's why relationships and partnerships are important to us and how can we support our community to live and grow and prosper. Uh, for us, it is not always solely the focus. It's not about return on investment. It is about intergenerational um, yeah. Uh, we call it kaitiakitana. Mm -hmm. yeah, a wonderful and important concept. Now, we don't want to hold the time, so can I just see if there are people who want to ask questions before I... I can't actually see you. So. <laughs> just in the middle here, can we get a mic down this way? My name is Hugo Christensen, I'm from uh, Empowered Christchurch and I've got a question which has to do with the planning for the city. One of the critical things for, for a future of any city is sustainability. We have an uh, instrument here which is called uh, the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, which is practically the hottest potato in, in Christchurch. Sarah ignored this uh, this. Uh, uh, policy when they did the zoning. When the land use recovery plan took place, the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement was ignored. When then uh, council was passed over the responsibility for the district plan, and again the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement was ignored. Now this hot potato lies in the hands of uh, regenerate Christians. When will the sustainability of the city be dealt with and the unsustainable practices which are taking place in the coastal areas, when will they stop? And when will those people also give in a future? That could just about take a, a seminar in its own right, and it will actually, because um, the issue that's being raised uh, in part will be addressed by the development of the coastal hazards chapter of the district plan. So there was a decision taken to pull that um, 
component of the uh, replacement district plan process out of um, that very truncated and fast track process to enable uh, further investigations on uh, the different elements of the coastal environment because it's not just the, 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 the sea coast but of course the inside the estuary there is coastal environment as well. We've got quite a lot of work to do. We're working in conjunction with Environment Canterbury and the other districts that have a coastline as well and looking for central government guidance as well. But the actual process of dealing with the coastal hazards chapter in a formal sense won't really begin until the end of the year um, or even the beginning of next year. But the actual um, work in terms of engaging with communities in those coastal environments will start um, much sooner than that. Thank you, Leanne. Now, we are actually due to have a break in a couple of minutes to introduce a couple of extra people. If you're very, very hot for people, would be really good for somebody to deal with it. Yeah, no, we'll, have a, we'll, have, a, we'll have a separate seminar dedicated to that whole issue. There's, there's a lot of work to be done there. Thank you, Hugo. Any other questions before we have a quick break and bring our next panellist to the stage? You uh, referred to marketing. You know, what you've got the ideas of the panel are on marketing our city. I went to Freiburg about 18 years. Freiburg was uh, demolished by bombing of the war and rebuilt along similar principles to what Christchurch has been developed on. And the, uh, the, the mission or the, the uh, catchphrase for Freiburg is now Freiburg City of Vision. And that really resonated with me. I thought you know, it was a forward looking sort of thing that. Um, has motivated the citizens of Freiburg. They're now right behind it and proud of what their city is and its, uh, its modern uh, outlook and, uh, and motivates um, people to come here from other places too, which is why I went to Freiburg. I think, Will, should we start with you on that one? Uh, this is a question also for the second half, but we might as well start to tackle it now. Do we need a vision and if so, what should it be? Sorry, do we have a vision? Do we or have or need? The we, the general we. <laughs> do, do we? Well, I can't speak for everybody in the room. Um, in the conversations I'm involved with, um, I think there's an opportunity for New Zealand um, to position itself a bit differently. We are tiny. You know, I'm obviously not originally from here. I've been here 14, 15 years now. And uh, very proud to be a Kiwi. Um, but when the rest of the world looks at us, the country's small, and then you zoom in on Christchurch, Christchurch is even smaller. But I think we can embrace um, the reality of the opportunities we've had to build, um, I think, a strong uh, ecosystem of technology fueling some of the other industries. And why I focus on that is it's real, it's not just words, we can show people the technology we're developing. We've got Callahan, that's a very effective tool for some of these organisations to use. And then actually I think it's bigger than Christchurch. What I'd love to see is the regions connecting better. So we're not trying to create Silicon Valley in each place. So that we're realistic about the resources we have and we say, okay, these regions, if you're passionate about aeronautic, go here. If you're passionate about agri, go here. If you're passionate about this, go there. Then we'll be taken seriously, globally. That will be a reason for specialists to come here internationally and it'll attract investment. That's my personal vision. I don't know if it's everybody else's. Well, I think uh, much of the second half of this session will be uh, consumed with exactly that point. So I wonder if we should take a quick break. Renee's waving at me furiously. Uh, and we will bring our, our next two panellists to the stage to join our existing panellists. Thank you. Run straight to your legs. Thank you.